Good afternoon, everyone, and you're very welcome to the fifth of event in this virtual week for the regional series for CETA. My name is Suzanne Purcell, and I am general manager of CETA. We are delighted to have Arup and Diatech as sponsors of the regional event series. And CETA Skillnet is a partner with CETA with, through our CETA Skillnet training network. Here you'll just see this is a, gives you a quick overview for those of you who are only attending today or who have attended any of the previous events this week. We've had a very successful event week with loads of interesting and dynamic presentations. So anyone who's missed any of those, they will be put up on the CETA YouTube channel. So you'll be able to reference them there again. I'm just quickly going to run through this because we have new people every day. And yes, we have some people who are with us every day. So you can ignore me now for the next 90 seconds. So if you aren't already a member of CETA or if you're interested in being a member of CETA in 2021, what does CETA have to offer your company? So you have the opportunity to avail of 30% discount off CETA skill net funding. And this is for any training bespoke or standard training that your employees may need in relation to the construction technology space. You can promote your organization's profile on your own exclusive membership page with your contact details within CETA's website. You get free attendance to the CETA's Circular Economy Series, the Tech Trends Series, and the regional events like this. And you will also be able to avail of a membership discounted rate to attend the annual conference, and this year it is the CETA BIM gathering. So that just gives you a quick overview of the Circular Economy Series and the titles of those 10 events. That series has been run in conjunction with CIOB, GMIT, IGBC, which we're delighted with. The Technology Trend Series really is looking at the top 10 technologies that transform the construction sector. And we have some great sponsors there um, whose support is very beneficial to CETA. Those 10 events, you can just look there, it gives you a quick overview um, of what those titles are, just to make you aware the event that's scheduled for next week, the 22nd of April, that has been moved to the 29th of April. So information on those speakers and their titles of their talks will be getting released over the next few days. The CETA Skillnet Training Network, that's been in existence since 2008. So it is a very vibrant, diverse group of companies with a huge cross-section of courses that are being run. If you go on to the CETA Skillnet website, you'll be able to find information on that. If there are any courses that you would like to do that are not listed, please do get in contact with the CETA team. Eleni and myself or Shannon will be delighted to help any of you. And if you email admin at CETA.ie, you'll get through to us there. The final conference for CETA in 2021 is the gathering. So the CETA BIM gathering, this will be the fifth time the gathering will be running. And there are 10 different themes that have been selected for that. We've already received abstracts. So there's 42 abstracts already received covering all of the 10 categories. We then have six keynote speakers, six um, sponsor talks, and we will have some case study and highlight presentations as well. So if you aren't already following CETA or you want to find out more, the CETA website has a huge amount of information in terms of events, past events, training, membership and sponsorship. Just click into the relevant tabs that you're interested in. Follow CETA on Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube or Facebook or just contact the admin or the CETA team directly on admin at CETA.ie if you can't find what you're looking for. And as ever, please subscribe and sponsor. Please subscribe and follow us on the CETA YouTube channel. You'll get notified for all the new web or event uploads like today's event. There are 10 years of material actually up there. So once you subscribe to that, you will be able to find out what's been released and the latest talks that have been held. So now I'm delighted to hand over um, to Sean Carroll, who's actually um, going to chair today's session. And I'll just stop sharing here now. Um, so I hope you've got a hope you have a great event. And for anyone who's missed any of the previous ones, just subscribe and you'll be able to hear about all the previous presentations that took place. So thanks a million. OK, <clears throat> so thanks very much, Suzanne. And welcome, everyone. So is my screen coming through there OK? Um, so welcome everyone to CETA's online regional week. So we're into day five of the week's activities. So I had the opportunity to look at one or two of the early session, earlier sessions, which proved very successful. And I'm very confident we can continue now on that trend today with another great lineup of speakers for you. So my own name is Sean Carroll and I'm a lecturer at the MTU and I'm the BIM Technologies course coordinator. So I will give you some updates from MTU and I will also maybe discuss some of our students' work. 
Um, some of our speakers today include James Young, who's a director at Evolution Innovation, and James will be discussing the design of certified offsite construction systems. We have Jonathan Reinhardt um, of Datech, who will be discussing practical BIM workflows for SME architecture and design firms. And finally, we have Shona Hurley, who's a charter engineer at Arup, who will be discussing BIM interoperability for structural analysis. So I guess in line with other events this week and to keep a bit of a flow to today's activities, we'll have all presenters present and then at the end we'll have an opportunity for a Q&A. So I guess as chair today, I'll keep a close eye on the chat. So any questions you have as the speakers progress, please feel free to post in the chat and we'll take a look at those for you at the end of the session. So I guess the first key update for me anyway is we are now in fact an MTU. So we've joined our colleagues from IT Tralee to become the Munster Technological University. So it's a great time for both staff and students alike and an exciting time to be part of this as the, the benefits of this region become realized. Um, so my presentation, I guess, just a quick overview. I'm going to take a look maybe at our key offerings in BIM, which include our level eight program, our degree program. And now we have a new HDIP, a level nine in BIM and digital AC. But I guess rather than just simply listing off modules to you, I want to kind of exemplify the great work our students do. So I've taken the liberty of recording a couple of short videos for you. So I guess just to kind of give a quick overview that that Bachelor of Science in BIM, that level eight program, it's a 60 credit award. It's delivered over two years on a part-time basis. So it's very much kind of aimed at industry type professionals. Um, the, the kind of pillars of it, semester one is BIM technologies. Semester two is strategic BIM and M and semesters three and four are applied BIM and M. So for someone who might be in the opportunity to kind of fully commit to a level eight program, these are all individual CPD op opportunities of their own. So each of those semesters can be just taken as a, as a CPD opportunity. So I guess just to maybe kick things off, when we think of BIM, we think of the, te the technology, the process, the people. So I guess one of the first things students get their hands on when they get into CIT is to get hands on with the technology. So this is where they use Autodesk Revit, which is a BIM authoring software. Um, so students that might have no experience in Revit get to jump onto an authoring software such as Autodesk Revit, and they can get this concept of creating a model. So you're not just creating drones, you're creating a graphical information model. And from that graphical information model, we can create our rendered images. We can create our drawings from that. We can create our schedules. So uh, I guess it's just about getting students used of the, the, to, of the technology. So with any key uh, BIM process, your common data environment is central to everything you do. And at MTU, we use Autodesk BIM 360. So I've just taken uh, a quick video here of a student's work who has uploaded onto BIM 360. So it's great to have, let's say, a, a cloud-based common data environment where as an educator, I can go in, I can look at my student's work, um, there's a lot of inbuilt functionality within this, such as the immersive tool here, where we can take a look inside of the model, we can jump in, we can explore it in full. So obviously this has great ben benefits for industry, not just, just educators. Um, so from a very early stage in our programs, what we're trying to instill in our students is this PAS 1192, or what's now the ISO 19650 workflow is of, they have work in progress folders, which that work then transfers into shared, and then ultimately becomes published or archived. So while at the start of the program in the common data environment in BIM 360, they're simply creating these folders. BIM 360 itself has a lot of inbuilt functionality, which as the students kind of progress along into the course, they get to use a module known as the design collaboration module. So just to give an example of this, a recent project that our students would have done is we would have shared a point cloud of them of one of the open atriums here in CIT. And so this is kind of students in the latter end of the program. So first they create their exchange information requirements, their BIM execution plans. So with all of that documentation in place, they can then start to deliver on this project. So with design collaboration, some of the benefits of it is, so the students are tasked with creating an architectural structural and an, and an MEP model. So we have these swim lanes at the top, so we can see as those models progress where they're at. So students, let's say, as they're creating their architectural model, they can link in the latest structural model or the latest uh, MEP model, whatever the case may be. And there's some novel features within the design collaboration, such as this, where you can explode the model. And I guess some of my favorite features, to be honest with it, would be the kind of change management type functions where there's a little icon here to the left-hand side where you can take a look at 
what has changed in the last model. So here's an overlay, but you can kind of have a side-by-side -side view as well. So all that's really changed and this is the door, but you can kind of see in a very real and, and visual sense what, what has kind of happened in, in those models. So that's kind of our ordering software and our common data environments. Uh, but of course, BIM is probably far more about a process than simply just technology. So another key module within our program is the BIM theory and practice. So this is where we instill the theory of BIM. We look at BS 1192 and PAS 1192, and that's transition into 19650. We look at lean and BIM. And this is where students get that opportunity to write exchange information requirements, BIPs, both pre and post. They look at the, the, the typical standards, methods, and procedures. So it's very much about getting that process behind BIM, because I guess everyone hears about the technology, but I guess what BIM really is, is, is it's, it's that process. Um, so then maybe just to kind of exemplify some of the other technologies that we use. So on the virtual design and construction module, which is a module I lead, uh, we look at some visual programming and scripting. So for anyone that mightn't be aware, Dynamo, it's a, it's a visual programming and scripting tool, which is for, to a large extent, you can think of it as computer programming, whereby we can create these scripts. So I just have an example here of a steel portal frame where we can have a parametrically controlled script. So by moving what are known as number sliders here at the start of my script, I have a parametrically controlled frame where I'm doing no modeling now in Revit. All of this is kind of, it's true the Revit API by the use of Dynamo. And once you have your geometry that can then be exported into Revit where you can then document it, or indeed it could be sent off for structure analysis or an energy analysis. Um, so I guess Dynamo like, I could do a presentation all of this on its own, but I mean, amongst the, the novel uh, things that you can do with it, it's a geometry creation tool, but it's also an information management tool whereby you can actually mine the graphical information of a BIM model. Um, still on the virtual design and construction, maybe some of the immersive workflows that we explore with our students. So we use Enscape as our live rendering um, software. So we have VR headsets here in, in MTU. We have an Oculus Rift, HTC Vive. So with those headsets, you can jump into these models and you can explore them in real time. But what you can also do is you can create novel features such as 3D panoramas. So I just have an image here of a QR code scanned image. So I will be sharing these slides as part of this presentation. And if you simply take your phone and if you were to scan that QR image, what you would get then is you get an image like this where you can get a real immersive experience of that model. And then if we just click the Google Cardboard lens, we then get a scary stereographic image, which could be put into a portable head headset device. Uh, so that's the virtual reality side of things. On the augmented reality side of things, I just have a screen recording here of my phone. So I'm just in my office and we use some novel apps whereby we can project images of models we've created. So again, I've just kind of created a, a steel frame here where I'm just in my office, I can kind of project that out and I can inspect the frame I created. So when we think of virtual reality, we're thinking about that, uh, that, that virtual world, world, that immersive kind of false type world, whereas with the augmented reality, it is the real world, but we're just layering it with digital information. So that's, that's kind of the immersive side of things. So that, that course again, so that's that level eight, uh, Bachelor of Science in Building Information Modeling and Management. So again, each of these core pillars are a CPD offering all of their own. Again, I'll be sharing the slide deck. So there is a link here to the course. Uh, BIM Technologies, which was the first semester of the course, I guess, you know, that's where everything has evolved for us here at MTU. And it's been our most successful kind of delivery or CPD offering. There's been 150 graduates to date. Springboard funded in 2015 and 2019, and it was a finalist in the 2020 ICE Awards recently in the educational category. So I guess, you know, part of, you know, obviously coming to MTU, you want to learn all the skills in BIM, but you also get an opportunity to network with like-minded individuals from kind of key companies that, you know, uh, you know, it, it's, it's basically just a great opportunity for you to network and, and, and to grow your network as well as it is to actually get the skills that, that you require in BIM. Um, so, one of my final slides, I guess, is just that we now have a level nine opportunity as well. So we have a HDIP and BIM and digital AEC. So we can see the educational aim here. It's to convert the traditional architecture, engineering or construction graduate into a skilled postgraduate in BIM. So amongst the pillars that we explore are digital FM, asset management, data management, energy certification. So I guess this is a brand new program. Um, we got funding underneath the Human Capital Initiative this year. So students that enrolled in this program had 90% of their fees covered. 
Um, it's an 18 month program with three semesters and one of those semesters is a work placed module. So there's really only kind of two uh, campus based Can modules and um, the other module is in work placement. So just some closing thoughts to bring it to an end. I guess um, I'll have to probably get a, another quote from my next presentation as I've used the same from before, but I think it's quite appropriate. It's that the pace of change has never been this fast. Yes, it will never again be this slow. So it is a great challenge for us as educators to kind of keep up with all, in all this BIM space. It's equally a challenge for, for, for those in industry. I guess the main point to kind of take away from today is that at MTU, we're, we're, we're well established in, bit, in, in delivering BIM programs, and we're very open to collaborative and research opportunities with industry and academic partners. Uh, everything from 3D printing to automation are all kind of our research interests and areas. So if there's anyone looking at this presentation today or indeed in the future, and if you'd like to reach out and get in touch with me, my email is sean.carl at cit.ie, and we could hopefully identify some synergies where we could help you advance your BIM uh, opportunities. So I guess that's it for me for now. Um, so I guess as chair, I'd like to maybe just call our first speaker for today, who is James Young of Evolution Innovation. So James, if you're ready there, I'll stop sharing my screen. And in your own time, please feel free to start sharing your own. Thanks, Sean. Uh, is are you able to see that? Yeah. Yep. Just go again, James. Yeah. Yeah. Is that coming up? Uh, you might go to display settings and swap it there again, just up top. Okay. Yeah, you're good to go now. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Sean. Um, yeah. So my name is James Young. I'm the director of engineering services in Evolution Innovation. Um, and today I'm just going to briefly talk about how we kind of um, our design process is using BIM. Uh, when using off-site uh, systems. So our general mission um, as a company is, is to promote MMC off-site construction to the industry and to the general public and to ensure that it is of the highest quality and complies with our surpasses with all building regulation requirements and standards. Just a, a, a brief um, introduction about our company. We're, we're, our headquarters is in Cork, um, in Shannon. Uh, we also have offices in Dublin, Galway, and, and a headquarters in the UK. We have four departments in, in our company. So structural and BIM will be the one I'll be predominantly talking about today. But just a, a, just a briefing on the other departments, we have a building physics and sustainability department that specializes in, in, in um, sources such as being um, NSEI accredited thermal modelers, daylight analysis, dynamic simulation, modeling overheating analysis, condensation risk analysis, and so on. Um, we also have a department that specializes in product development and, and testing, so getting systems to be um, NSEI certified. We, um, we do a lot of fire testing, acoustic testing for many of our clients. Um, and then we have a, a quality um, department specializing in auditing, um, FPC and, and CE marketing. Um, and just there, the, the, the general areas. So we specialize in MMC uh, as a whole from design, BIM, um, building physics, um, product certification across a number of various technologies. Um, uh, across Ireland and, and abroad. So the main work that our department does in relation to, in, in relation to MMC is that we're specialist structural enge engineering and BIM design consultants, and that we specialize in, um, in the construction and the manufacturing area. We work a lot in 2D and 3D volumetric um, MMC systems, and, um, and we do a lot of uh, Complete a lot of BIM design and manufacturing detailing, as well as the structural design for, for many of our clients. We've been nationally and internationally recognised as experts in, in MMC, and we and and as part of our system, we 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 kind of implement the design for manufacture and assembly. That is a core element of the design processes that we that we drive. So from from a, from the work that we do in in MMC, we're involved in anything from housing to, to mid-rise developments all the way to the tallest modular buildings in the world. Um, again, we're just various accreditations. We're also uh, CPD accredited with, with Engineers Ireland um, as well. So 
just recently, um, MMC was 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 kind of categorized into I think six categories to kind of differentiate into each of the various types that are available in the market because offsite can cover a broad range of of um, of of ways of of construction. So two of the main ones I'll be talking about here is category one, which is the pre-manufacturing 3D primary structural systems, and category two, which is the pre-manufacturing 2D structural systems. So each of these systems go through rigorous manufacturing process to meet the design requirements within each of their respective manufacturing facilities. So we need to ensure that the design processes that, that we do need to accommodate the precision, the precision engineered systems that get made and get delivered to site. Um, some of the NSI certified systems that are currently available in Ireland. So in the category one, you, you would have uh, Modern Homes Ireland um, in Cavan. You would have ESS Modular in Dublin and uh, a recent one, RBC Modular in Limerick. And um, there's a number of more that will be uh, coming on stream in, in the coming months and years. And also in category two, you have um, Horizon Offsite in Tipperary, Vision Built in Galway. Uh, MFC in Navin and Carlo Concrete. So each of those companies are, are NSCI certified and um, are operational both generally in Ireland and some um, abroad as well. So in relation to offsite, um, the system, the offsite system design process. So when we work on any MMC project, we we have a specific design process. Uh, we use to deliver the projects from conception to completion on site. They are mainly driven by uh, four key four key um, sections. So you have the structural specification, um, usually with our um, um, uh, structural design software, our pre-construction model, typically using um, Autodesk Revit. We have manufacturing detailing that can be used with specialist software like Vertex. Um, that also creates things like assembly drawings. So Vertex Tecla um, software is similar to that that would create assembly drawings that then go to manufacturing to be to be produced. So to look at each one of those specifically through a process, obviously we would create a, um, a structural model of a particular building, assessing the loads, inter, um, including the, the hot roll steel elements, and in this case, um, coal form steel elements that would be built within within the structure. So this is an example of a category uh, two um, building. So within that model, um, through our BIM design and our structural analysis, we're outputting the stud specification, the hot roll steel specification, bracing, lintels, fixings. Obviously, you output the foundation loads, and then at the end of that process, an IFC is is extracted and and passed on to the the, the BIM designer who was creating the pre-construction model. So the model you see there is typically done in in Revit that we would do. So this is where we where we would integrate the system design to be specific for the particular manufacturer in question. It's core it's 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 the tool that we use to coordinate with a design team with with an architect. Um, to ensure heights, widths, doors, um, all the OPS. You get involved with M&E integration, with service routes, creating um, pockets in walls, services in beams, and, and, and optimizing routes to ensure um, there is no, or complete a clash detection element and, and kind of complete the design. So this is, this is where the, 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 the main body of the design is done and frozen bringing in the structural design that we would have done previously and then integrate it with the rest of the design team on a particular project. So we bring that to a stage in this case where what we like to call I suppose design freeze um, or design frozen stage. So when we get to that, it can be passed on to, to the detailing aspect. So it, this is where the precision element um, based on the processes that have been used to date are, are brought to bear. So what you see there is a typical five-story panelized structure that has specific studs, bracings, integrated hot roll steel. Um, each of those elements will have um, services and, and other aspects associated with it. And through that element, um, the outputs are, are, are taken from that, um, that, that, that framing model, where, for example, CSV files 
are taken out to manufacture the cold form studs, bracing and lintels, and again to a high degree of tolerance, plus or minus 0.5 mil. The IOC is, 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 is sent to the hot rolled steel fabricator to produce their, their element of the structure. And then if the, if the concrete floors is, is using something like a composite concrete deck system that we extract um, the, 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 the sheet lengths that, that are sent to production. So all families are parametric and are designed within the model to allow for each of the elements to be tracked, procured and manufactured. So once that extracts, you get into the specifics of assembly drawing. So this is an extract from the BIM model we've, we've, we've brought through our, our specific design process. And here, for example, you see a particular um, piece list on the top right hand side where each of the components are listed, itemized and, and the specific links where that they'll be manufactured to. So something like that, along with the CSV files would be sent to the um, uh, what we call a roll forming machine that a lot of our of our MMC clients would have. So what you have there on the left hand side is a typical Howick roll forming machine. Now you've Howicks, you've frame can't you stock there's there's many various machines. But as you see kind of on the, the right hand side, these components are specifically manufactured to the correct length. They have ancillary elements like dimples for connection services for uh, punch punches for services um, and are all you know, manufactured to a high level of, of, of tolerance. And then finally, you have your installation drawing. So where out, output through the, the final BIM design, you get an, an extract drawing, itemizing panel numbers, hot roll steel numbers, and, and dimensions and locations of particular grid lines as required. Again, this is just another um, quick example of a particular structure that we're, we're that's that's under construction in, in in Cork at the moment. So again, large scale, driven through our BIM process, and and then you have other additional elements that can be added to this. So again, calling on all the various components, they, you can procure your windows and your doors from these models. You can quantify fixings and other ancillary items, um, and this whole process significantly reduces the amount of waste in, in, the, in the element of the construction. And through the, the BIM design that we kind of implement, it kind of, it, is, it allows for a, a rapid design process and can, can significantly uh, reduce the construction program by up to 25% or even, or even more. So uh, the, main, the main aspect from our perspective is precision engineered solutions require precision design processes. So these are not systems that begin on site. These begin in the manufacturing facility before they get to site. And obviously it has to be made accurately. And the BIM design allows us to act to, to, to allows for accurate designs to be integrated into a particular structure to allow it to be manufactured correct, manufactured correctly and on time. And our BIM process is driven to allow, um, uh, to allow this for any off-site manufacturer that we work with, regardless of whether it's a category one or a category two. So Evolution was um, 10 years old last year and, and kind of in that time across all our clients, we've, we've, we've delivered you know, in excess of 12,000 student, student beds, 8,000 hotels beds, um, 10,000 residential units, and, and we've also done work in educational and, and in the healthcare sector as well. So just to um, finish off, I just have just, a, I suppose, just a, a brief overview of some projects that we've done. We've done some, you know, projects um, like is it residential projects that we've done like that, done a lot of hotels. Um, We've been involved in some significant projects like this one where it was a, a 26 block student development um, in, southern, in southern England. Um, and then there's other examples like another student accommodation job that's, that's been finalized with structures up to 10 stories in this one. Um, again, another similar project that's, that's been finalized currently. Um, I think this one has, is about 1400 student beds um, in this particular project. Um, and then just to finish off, I just have this one particular 
project that um, that we worked on last year, a uh, 24-bit hosp hospital extension that we did in Limerick. Um, we started the design on the 25th of March, 2020, and uh, practical completion was done on the 2nd of July. So that that wouldn't have happened without the without the Pacific design process that that we that we implemented and adopted in terms of optimizing the design, um, implementing and the BIM processes with, with with the rest of the design team, and getting the systems made um, efficiently, and and getting them to built on site accurately. Okay, so um, again, that's that's just a snippet of the projects that we've worked on. Um, so. Again, uh, um, thanks for thanks for your time today, and I guess we'll take any questions at the at the end. Excellent, James. Thanks very much. Very interesting talk, and it's great to see that uh, modern methods of construction in Ireland are finally so sort of gone beyond that tipping point. That they are now a real alternative to kind of traditional methods of construction. So that's excellent. Thanks very much, James. So I guess, as, as we said earlier in the session, we, we will try to keep the flow going with the presenters. So I might just call upon Jonathan Reinhardt now to start sharing his screen. And at the end of the session, we'll have an opportunity for questions for James and, and for others. So thanks again, James. And Jonathan, whenever you're ready. Brilliant. You can see my PowerPoint? Yeah, perfect. You're good to go. Good stuff. And you can hear me OK? Yeah, excellent. Thanks. Good stuff. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for, for that, James. That, that was very interesting and for that intro, Sean. Um, so today I'm going to present on the practical digital workflows for SME architecture and design firms. The reason I say practical is because uh, I, I suppose I've worked on, on two sides uh, of the industry. Uh, I've worked in, in the industry extensively for, for, for about 12 or 13 years. Uh, and then in the last few years, I kind of work on the, the uh, consultancy side of things uh, for Autodesk distribution. Uh, but uh, the workflows I will show you today are workflows that I have used in practice. Um, and, you know, I, I've seen great benefits to them. And I always like to pitch um, BIM as being, you know, it is available for smaller firms and medium firms and even micro firms to get on that BIM ladder. It's not only reserved. Uh, for, for large complex uh, projects, while well, obviously there's huge benefits to it uh, in, in, in complex projects, uh, it, it definitely has its place in small architectural design firms, you know, one person firm, five person, 10 person, it definitely has its place. And, and some of the workflows I'd like to show you today is kind of uh, pitch into that and, and that type of workflow that I've used in those type of architectural firms. So I work for, for Daytech Solutions and we're the Autodesk distributor. Uh, in, in uh, UK, Ireland, and, and globally as well. So my name is, is Jonathan Reinhardt, Chartered Architectural Technologist as of last week. Uh, I've worked as designer, architectural technologist, uh, BIM manager, uh, about 16 years in total in the industry uh, since, since my very first architectural uh, role back in 05. Uh, and I, I primarily work on BIM implementation for SME firms and uh, training and consultancy as well. Uh, I've also done the, the Masters in BIM Management in TUD, one of the first uh, graduates, luckily enough, uh, and, and studied architectural technology. And I'm also a co-founder of Arkley.ie, an, an online platform uh, for architects. So I always like to, 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 to I suppose, get out there that uh, Revit and, and uh, those type of tools, they are quite good design tools. They're not just construction tools, and you can create uh, quite... Uh, impressive designs and workflows using the digital tools and I'm not saying to completely move away from uh, move away from pen and paper whatsoever you know that is still a very important part of an architect's job uh, of an architect's process um, and I appreciate that it, it will always be part of, of the design process but I do think that um, there are particular software that can complement those type of processes uh, and feed into the to, into uh, the BIM processes as well uh, later on in, in you know, construction stage or detailed design stage of a particular building uh, that is going, happens to be going through a BIM process. Because like Sean said, uh, BIM is, it, it's a process, it's not a product, it's not a tool, it's not a software, it is a process and involves lots of different uh, people and stakeholders and moving parts. Uh, and, and part of that is the software. So I definitely uh, lean on the fact that, you know, it's quite a holistic approach to, to BIM. Uh, projects. 
this was, was, was just a design I produced uh, for a building, for, for uh, conceptual design for, for an architect uh, using Revit. Uh, but I think with Revit, you can really push it to that uh, architectural type of level. Uh, even at the conceptual stage, I, I think it definitely has its place. Uh, and we've other uh, software we've used, such as uh, Format Pro, which is what I'm going to run through today, which is what this image was produced in. So the agenda, I'm going to run through and obviously get it done within the next 15 minutes. Uh, I'm going to just briefly go through some of the Revit 2022 updates that came out about two weeks ago. Uh, I'm going to give you an introduction to Format Pro. Uh, I'm going to show you the workflow Format Pro to Revit. Uh, I'm going to show you InfraWorks, just the model builder and how an architect or building designer could use InfraWorks. And then I'll briefly explain the workflow on using InfraWorks into Format and into Revit as well. So kind of looking at those three products mainly, uh, InfraWorks, Format uh, and Revit as well. So I'll briefly run through these updates. Uh, I just picked out a couple of the updates that I thought would be quite relevant uh, and definitely ones that stuck out to me fr from working in practice. Um, so there's a, a new for loading in families to Revit. There's a new user interface, uh, which to me is most welcome because you used to have to go through Windows Explorer or File Explorer. Uh, so a new search option, being able to filter through uh, your content library, whether that's the, the proprietary one or your own content library. Uh, so that's now as part of Revit 2022. Um, native P 2D PDF export, uh, very much welcomed. I know we, we had this in, in AutoCAD for a long time. It was very, very useful. Uh, so, so that's now available in 2022. And um, what I will cover in the demo is the kind of the, the format pro workflows, but the, there are enhanced workflows as well uh, from inside Revit uh, alongside using format pro by using something called the 3D sketch tool, which is new to Revit. Uh, and you're able to, to, to take your uh, Revit geometry uh, into format and vice versa as well. Uh, you can import format as CAD format. Uh, and I, I will explain what, what uh, format is once I get into it. Uh, Revit 2022 now has IFC4 certifications. Um, you, there are inventor to Revit uh, model workflows as well, which is also much welcomed. Um, Multi-category tagging for all taggle, taggable categories. And I know for myself from working on, on real world projects, uh, this is a very uh, welcomed update. Uh, revision numbering, uh, which can help you meet the ISO 19650 uh, workflows or, or uh, compliance as well, if that's what you're working to. Um, so that's much welcome for, for, for that. For those of you that are Revit users, uh, this will probably uh, be, be quite um, uh, news to you. Uh, spot slopes, elevations and ramps, minor kind of updates like that. There are lots more updates. Uh, I just kind of picked out a few that I found would, would uh, have benefited me definitely working in practice as well showing the wall core only in plan views. Uh, so if you're dimensioning to your construction dimensions from your 215 block work uh, to your 215 block work, you can obviously uh, just create that in the plan view by turning off non-core layers such as your plasterboard or your skim finish uh, or your, your dot and dab uh, or whatever your buildup is. Uh, but definitely for dimensioning, uh, and I know from creating construction drawings, uh, dimensioning and making sure you're snapping to the core uh, can take a fine art at, at some time. So that, that's definitely uh, a welcome change to me. Um, grids in 3D views, you can now view these in Revit 2022, um, where you could view levels in, in 3D views. Um, for the last number of versions of Revit, uh, you can now view the grids also in 3D views. Um, phase parameters, and I, I'm a big fan of phases in Revit. Uh, I think it's very powerful and, and being able to create your own phases, especially uh, to suit your project, uh, whether that's a, a small project or, or a complex project phases, uh, very powerful. But you can now convert this, uh, these phases into parameters in view filters as well. So if that's demolition, demolition purposes for a phase, or if it's a construction phase of phase one, phase two, phase three, et cetera. Uh, so being able to create a view filter based on that. Um, new default color schemes, a bit of a lighter pastel color. I know some of the, the previous uh, color fills were, were quite dark in color uh, and maybe uh, not as clear on, on a drawing or maybe hid some uh, room detail or uh, plan detail as well. So that's uh, much welcome too. Um, so that's some of the just updates that I pulled from an architectural perspective that I uh, would definitely uh, have benefited from while, while using them in the industry. Uh, so there are just a couple of those updates. So what I'm going to now is jump onto uh, Format Pro quite quickly, and um, just to explain what Format Pro is and how you can actually use this as part of your 
design workflow by, by uh, working on uh, your uh, BIM project while using Revit uh, and using Formit to feed in design information to that. So it does link in to Revit. It is a separate standalone piece of software. It can be used on a mobile device, but it can also be used on a desktop uh, version as well, which is what I'm going to do today. So I am just going to jump into Formit very quickly. So you'll recognize this type of user interface from maybe other types of 3D modeling tools. Uh, this is Autodesk's version of a massing tool or being able to explore designs at that kind of early stage. Um, and it works very simply uh, just by sketching uh, basic uh, kind of lines, creating surfaces. You can put in the dimensions if you want. So we have the set to millimeters. So we're just going to create a, a simple box here. I can add on more detail if I want. What I can do now is just extrude that up, creating fairly basic massing uh, with on, on a particular site. And while this may just look like, you know, it, it's just uh, some shapes I'm creating, you can actually do a lot more with these shapes. So for example, I can extrude that up a bit more. I can start to add levels and stuff like that. But what I can actually do is I can actually geolocate it. Uh, so let's hide my zoom screen. So if I geolocate this particular site, uh, it's going to pull in the local weather information and local location information. Uh, so it's automatically bringing me to, to Tralee as to where I am right now. And we'll see, pull that in. So it's brought in the, the location of the site, uh, but brought in the local weather information. It's brought in the height of the sun, uh, the intensity of any type of solar radiation that may occur on the site. And I suppose that the benefit of that uh, is that I can perform something called a solar analysis. So I can... Uh, just go to my top tab here, select all of my objects on my proposed buildings. You can actually move them in the site here as well. So let's place them on that greenfield site, let's say we're, we're going to construct there. Uh, just going to go into my solar tab, hit solar analysis. That will just take a second. Uh, data download in progress should be fine. I'm going to go to year cumulative. Zoom back out, and all it's doing is giving me a graph at the end here, and it's telling me uh, the kilowatt uh, hours per square meter uh, of uh, solar radiation on a particular facade, a particular roof, uh, and if I actually hover over it, it will give me the, the, uh, the uh, solar radiation factor on top of that. And what this can do at that early concept stage is actually inform, okay, we need to put uh, less glazing on our south facade. For example, so over here we can put less glazing or where it's uh, where it gets quite yellow or orange, we know we're going to get quite high intensity of sun across the year there. Uh, but we can also just look at, at a particular month if we want as well. So here we are in June, but what about in uh, January where it's when it's quite cold? Uh, so we, we, we can see that, yes, we're still getting a lot of sun uh, kind of in the, in the mid range of this. So maybe we, we, we can now uh, inform our, our, our design or iterate our design uh, by adding in perhaps some sort of solar shading, maybe some sort of breach allele or internal uh, uh, blinds into the building as well. But it can also inform you of where you should uh, best place your solar panels, for example, uh, on your particular building. So that's just kind of basic solar analysis uh, being done at that early conceptual stage. Uh, but being done uh, in, in a matter of minutes and something you can, can do on a site study in, you know, I did it entirely live here uh, in a very short amount of time. So let's say you've created that kind of basic mass, uh, let's say, of your building, uh, and you want to share it with a colleague, for example, and your colleague is not based in the same office as you, not based in the same country, perhaps. Uh, we can create something called a, a live sharing session. So I'm just going to add one open earlier. I'll close that one. I'm going to share this with my colleague that's based in Dublin. I'm based down in Cork, for example. Uh, start a sharing session. Just going to start session. So I tested this earlier. It worked perfectly. So let's hope all goes well doing it live. So it's given me a link here. I copy this link to a clipboard. I can then email that to my colleague, uh, or it could, it could happen to be the client or another designer. I can email that to them once they then receive that link. What happens? I'm going to go into my web browser as if I'm the person that has received this link. So I'm two different people here. Uh, this guy is in Dublin on the right-hand side, and then we've got our designer on the left-hand side who was based in Cork, for example. So they've shared that link. Uh, so I've been invite, invited to a collaboration session. I'm going to go to that collaboration session. It's just going to ask you to, to sign in with your Autodesk ID. That's all. 
invited me to a collaboration session and it has brought that up in the other person's screen. So you could in fact be based in, um, you could in fact be based in, uh, you know, any other location, uh, even, you know, far side of the world, and they will see what, the, what, you're, what you're constructing or building here in your model in complete real time. So you could have them on speakerphone, for example, uh, you know, over Zoom, over WhatsApp or, or, or whatever, or you can in fact send the messages in here as well to say, uh, please move block one, please move block one. Uh, so then uh, the other colleague can now come into this model in their web browser on the right hand side, can uh, simply come in and actually change this model. So what I'm gonna do as the other person, I'm going to select all of this. I'm actually gonna create a group of this. Create a group. Doesn't, oh, sorry, it doesn't allow me to create a group in this view, but that's fine. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna move that. And you will see on the left-hand side, the other person's uh, model is updating. And that happens completely just through an internet connection uh, and just by using format uh, tr very, through the web browser. So what we can now do is iterate this design collaboratively between two different designers. Um, I, I should actually change the units to, to, to metric, it's, but uh, it, it's still, still interpreted as, as metric dimensions. And then in fact, uh, the other designer can come into this side uh, and they can start to iterate, iterate the design as well. So they can in fact add in some different levels. Maybe they want to pull that out that side uh, and you can build up your, your site like that. Uh, and collaboratively, uh, collaboratively uh, design a building completely remotely. So that's uh, Format Pro, very brief introduction. It does a lot more solar analysis, uh, live collaboration. As well as that, what you can do is now import that information into Revit. I can import this in Revit. Just go into my add-ins tab, uh, import uh, Format to Revit, simply import that file. I won't do it now just to save time, but it imports it as a mass, and I can then convert all of that uh, model information into intelligent uh, information as part of your BIM workflow. So I can turn it into walls uh, just by using wall by face, uh, roof by face then as well, choose the roof and it will convert it all. So uh, that's how you bring format into Revit and that's how you get started with format. So the next thing I'm going to show you is just using InfraWorks. So a separate uh, piece of software known as InfraWorks so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to close format, continue and discard. So, so I'm just gonna go into a new, new piece of software here. So this is InfraWorks. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this, because in fact, if you have an AEC collection in your company, most businesses do if they have full version of Revit, you have access to Autodesk InfraWorks. Most people don't realize that. Uh, and what you can actually do is use something called the model builder. So here we have, this is an entire model of Cork City that I pulled in from, from GIS information. I didn't have to model a single thing. All I had to do was go to my home screen, go to Model Builder in InfraWorks, and basically just locate where my site is, zoom in on your site, wherever maybe based, uh, select a location, draw a rectangle around it, uh, choose your coordinate system. So you can go in and choose your ITM coordinate system. Um, choose your coordinate system, and that will then generate, it usually takes about three or four minutes, it will then appear here um, in your, your, um, in your InfraWorks screen. You can then open that up. This is one I prepared earlier. Let's give that a minute. Uh, so you can in fact save these to your uh, local machine, your server, or into BIM 360 if that's what you use. Uh, so that pulls in that model entirely from ArcGIS information. All of this, here we have Parky Guive. Now I know it's probably not uh, modeled perfectly accurately, but to be able to pull this together at that early conceptual stage uh, and show this to a client and then place your format model on top of this, which I'm gonna show you how to do now. So the next thing you can do is we can actually uh, export this to an FBX file, export 3D model. Just export this, uh, choosing the extents that you want, uh, entire model if you want, uh, just hit export. That sends that out to an FBX file. We can then come into format. So I'm gonna go into format, open up format, and I can import that uh, topography into format. Now it does, it's captured from, I presume it's captured from, from satellite imagery, uh, but you can see it, it, it's caught the River Lee there. Uh, it's converted that into a, a water surface itself, so it knows that it's water. Uh, it's converted the buildings and given them heights and I suppose a, a conceptual type facade, you can change that imagery 
uh, on any of the buildings, no, no, no problem whatsoever uh, inside InfraWorks uh, if, if you want to. So what you can do now is come into Format, just go to Import. I'm going to go to Locally because I have one I prepared earlier. Uh, just going to import that uh, particular file that I exported earlier. So it may take a minute because it's, it's, it's a big enough model, but let's just see how, how we uh, go. So that's just going to import that uh, from my desktop. It can, in fact, be saved on uh, BIM 360, as I said. So it's brought in that model quick enough. This is one I prepared earlier in. This is Laps Key here in Cork. Uh, here, this is the Elysium building here on the left-hand side. Uh, so it's automatically captured that uh, in ArcGIS, in InfraWorks, and I was able to bring it uh, directly uh, into Format. So what I can now do in Format is I can actually start overlaying my building design inside Format, uh, just grabbing my, my drawing tools, the same way I did initially, just grabbing my drawing tools. I am conscious of time, so I will finish up shortly. Uh, so let's say we want to build uh, a tower, which I believe is being done here. Uh, on top of this building, we can then just extrude that building. And again, we can go back into another live sharing session here if we want with our colleagues, uh, with the client or with any, you know, any other stakeholders involved on the project. Uh, we can then iterate this design, maybe change in elements of it. And you can, in fact, you, you can change a lot about the building. We can start to add materials if we want. Uh, so there's a complete uh, complete uh, library of materials here. So glazing, brick. Uh, you can go into quite fine detail, putting in the window grids, uh, the window mullions, the glazing, everything, if you really want. I prefer to keep uh, format just as a conceptual tool. You can create groupings and stuff like that as well. It's For some reason, it is not allowing me to in there, but I'll ignore that for now. Um, so I prefer to use it just at the conceptual stage so I can do my solar analysis. Uh, I can, in fact, do my, my shadow analysis as well. There are some early stage, I will caveat to say, early stage energy analysis. Uh, it's not necessarily set up for, 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 I suppose, Irish standards just yet, uh, but you can do early stage uh, energy analysis within here as well. And then again, import this into Revit, uh, import it into Revit, uh, and then model it up, detail it in a lot more information. And as well as that, it's going to bring in all this context for us. So to a certain degree, I wouldn't go constructing off this format model off the, of the land or anything like that. But to a certain degree, the fall of the land, the topography is, is relatively right. I, I actually brought in the entire model of Cork, as you saw earlier on, uh, and it captured all of the hills fairly accurately um, and, and to quite good detail as well. It also works. It's not only city sites that it does. It's also... This is a site I looked up in uh, Glen Bay the other day in County Kerry. Uh, we were uh, exploring buying a house, so I wanted to see if it was available on it. Um, so this is uh, we've got the the uh, this the the Ross Bay or um, the back of Kenmare here, uh, Dingle Peninsula or Dingle Bay here, and um, back at Dingle Peninsula, um, and it's brought in all of the building information. It even places the roads. And I can change these roads, so I know these roads don't have footpaths. They're, they're fairly rural roads. Uh, I can go in here, change these roads. In fact, turn it off to a, a completely blank road or just change it to, to a tarmac road if I want. So that's changed that road, uh, but it by default brings in um, all of the roads that it finds from your ArcGIS information. And again, if you're looking on the site on this, this can be imported into Format and into Revit as well. Uh, so, so it's not only exclusive for uh, format uh, as well. The same process by bringing it in through format, uh, you can bring it in, uh, just import uh, the geometry in here. If I bring it in here, let's see if I have a model created already, and then I will leave it at that. Uh, so what you need to make sure in Revit is that you have your massing uh, turned on in your visibility graphics. So probably quite a big model if from what I remember. Uh, so it's trying to bring in the entire model in the background, but uh, I think you, you, you get the idea anyway. I will leave that for now. It did work for me earlier. You know yourself, whenever you do anything live, uh, it's never to be trusted. Uh, but I hope that gave you a bit of an overview over workflows inside and outside of, of Revit, you know, Revit isn't the only tool that you can use necessarily as part of a BIM workflow. Uh, there's pre-design, there's conceptual design, all of that early stage stuff 
uh, can happen in a lot of other pieces of software as well before you even get to Revit. So thank you very much. I will leave it there for now and uh, save questions for the end, please. Thanks very much, Shannon. Well done. Uh, very brave of you to do a live demonstration, but it went very well for you there. And um, I think as a conceptual tool in particular, Formit and Infraworks, they, they look like excellent tools, I guess, being on the engineering side of things, they're not tools I would have had to use extensively myself, but for geographically dispersed members of the team, great to see that people could collaborate like that as well. Um, so we're not doing too badly on time. I guess we will keep all the questions to the end, but I do see that there was one that you could probably get, you could address now, Janin, or perhaps you might have done in your presentation already, which was, is Format Pro, so it's from Francis Robinson, is Format Pro a plugin for Revit 2022? Format Pro, you, you can only, Format Pro only comes as part of the AEC collection. Uh, you can use the standalone format inside your web browser. That's completely free. If you, if you actually Google format uh, now, it will bring you to that web browser um, and you can log in for free and use it. The Pro version is the only one that has uh, the collaboration tool. So, so I will caveat that. Um, and that comes as part of your AEC collection. Uh, the plugin to import comes installed with Revit as well. So, uh, yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Jonathan. So I guess we'll keep the rest of the questions for the end. And as we've said already, if anyone has just joined, feel very free to post into the chat and we will pick those up shortly. Um, so I'd like to invite Shauna Hurley now, uh, who's Chartered Structural Engineer at Arab, to uh, present. So Shauna, in your own time, if you'd like to start sharing your screen there. Thanks, Sean. Uh, just two seconds there now. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yep, you're good to go there now, Shauna. Thanks. Perfect. So as Sean said, um, I'm going to talk about today about BIM interoperability for structural analysis. So it's a bit different than what everything has been presented this week. I'm just kind of looking at the the kind of transfer between how we get to to structural design um, within the BIM environment. So to start off, um, so just to give a background of myself, um, I'm currently working with Arup. Um, and from before, I suppose, I, I was in, I was a CIT graduate, so I'm, I'm from Sean's earlier presentation, I know CIT very well. Um, so I suppose getting into the whole thing and what we want to achieve is BIM uh, and how we apply it to structural analysis. So for me, it's looking at like between Revit and, and, and Robot. So basically how do we transfer the structural BIM model, which is the structural frame that we create in Revit, um, and then transfer that into a structural analysis model. So what we look at is the different analysis package that can do that. And there is many out there. Um, to, I've just shown three here, uh, one being an Autodesk product of Robot Structural Analysis Professional. Um, there's also an Oasis GSA, which is used widely throughout Arup. Uh, and there's also Tech Structures, which is also used. Um, but today I'm just really going to focus on on robot because it's it's something that I've come across and, and dived into um, throughout my career. So I suppose taking it back in terms of structural design and apologies to all those mechanical, electrical or architectural engineers on the call. Um, so previously we did all our hand calculations and we've worked in the previous all, all by hand calculations and now we're going into 3D modeling, backing up those by hand calculations to make sure the assumptions we've put in are, are proven. Um, so I suppose when we look at BIM, and I won't go into it in too much, but like we look at architectural, the MEP environment, structural, there's ones like fire, the client, the, the uh, multiple number of disciplines that feed into Revit. Um, but I'm going to focus on the structural part. So looking at Revit, what, what is the output we want to get from Revit? Um, and it's it's usually like the structural drawings is, is our, our 2D um, input that is given out for IFC to a contractor to construct. Um, but now we're giving 3D models and we're in that environment that the 3D model needs to have everything. So I suppose going back another step um, and our structural design. So how do we link that in between our Revit and and the live BIM environment. So looking at the link between the two. So from my experience today, like sometimes some projects, you'd get a, a provisional architectural layout and it might be an, an AutoCAD drawing and that's where you'd start by pumping it into Revit or you might get an architectural, architectural Revit file at the start, which is being shared with the client. So like, how do we input the structure onto that? So first of all, it's the scheme. So we're, we're driving up a scheme, we're, we're using preliminary structural modeling, and then it's going, well, 
we this is getting a complicated structure we use a software analysis program so in this case robot and we do our structural design in that so if we look at two different bin workflows one and and they're kind of shared by autodesk mainly all the time so like say looking at a design focused one where we have a simple physical model or it can be a very complicated physical model all being created in revit but we're concentrating more on the analytical model the analytical being the stick frame which is what we're looking at when we look at the analysis part of things on from the structural design point of view so we create a structural model in revit and we concentrate on the analytical model we transfer it then from revit into the analysis package robot we look at the the analysis the design of the members and then it's the we transfer it back to revit so this is the ideal world that we really want to achieve and and that it has our final input there and and it's a converse um or a, a continuous process and any updates that happen any changes that happen and maybe a building is added on so i've just taken a simple kind of walkway building here so looking then at an analysis focused point of view so where the structural engineer is doing the analysis first so we don't have a revit model created we've, we've chosen to go down the route of the structure because there is might be changes upcoming it's it's kind of like a, an engineer basis or, or preferability on, on on this and it's also set up by the whole team at the start of the project and what's the best workflow that works for the project itself so like in this case we're looking at the analysis model being created in robot where then we're transferring once we have all our design done we're transferring it to revit looking at the analytical model just to make sure everything pops in okay and then the physical model then which is automatically generated from the analytical model but there might be a few changes there might be kind of offsets there might be members to pull back there might be a floor just to update the the look of it the feel of it um adding in a few recesses that we mightn't have had it in the in the structural analysis part of you and then that's the point of view that like you input all your cat uh, your drawings out of so it's already there so this is kind of i suppose a preferred route if you want to get something to a CAD technician very quickly to draw and you have an analysis model ready to go because you've been working on it all along but there was no um, CAD, CAD technicians available or Revit modelers available to start putting a bit of structure so you've somewhere given them to start rather than using structural sketches which we create all the time um, so I'm going to dive into a bit of Revit and the link and a few tips and tricks that I've come across along the way that are also shared on Autodesk University or Autodesk website and, and the forum. So these are kind of things that I've come across and, and there might be multiple different ways that are chosen by a different company. And now an Arup have like a multiple types of templates already set up, but I'll go through tips and tricks that I've come across and I find that are useful and it, we sh they should be shared. So. I suppose we start and the preferred solution would be that the engineer would model the structural um, in Revit. So with a concentration though on the analytical model, okay? So you start by, you bring in your architect's AutoCAD drawing. So you have an, a, a starting point, you can set out the structure, set out a frame. You might have an indicative hand calculations to size few members that you can start inputting straight away. Um, and then you set up levels, grades, et cetera, modeling the members. And then you kind of work on your look, all right, the analytical model is what I'm focusing on. I want to focus on all the stick members. I want to see them. But like when you turn on the analytical model, which is from your project browser, from your AA button on your keyboard, you're literally just getting black stick frame. It's telling me nothing. I'm not sure if it's all connected properly. So we need to kind of go through a few steps like that. So like looking at the analytical model, um, we can we can distinguish where like uh, where they join, where they end, where they connect. So like I'd like to change it and add a bit of color. So there's an option in the object styles of changing the colors of members. So changing all the beams to say orange, changing all the columns to say blue, um, and then you can go on and say right, I'd like to actually distinguish a bit further and see where this, the beams have been drawn. So looking at the start and the finish of the beam, and this kind of comes into play when you're looking at the local axis of the member and whether what way it's facing, where is the top flange, where is the bottom flange of a steel member, for example. Um, so we can differentiate at that. So that's what under, under the structural settings tab. So once you click that, you can see down the top bottom left that like you have a red and a green end. So this is also set up in the colors. So I can tell you exactly where the start and the end of the beam is. Um, and then we want to just double check that everything is connected um, because multiple times now you have a huge structure and, and you might be struggling with connections and how to connect everything in together. 
So these is where the nodes come into play. And they're very important when we want to look at like the connectivity of our elements. So first you can turn them on within the, the visibility graphics. So once we take on those, we're getting on our nodes for a structure. But we want to look at how do we verify the connected and unconnected nodes. So like how do we look at um, the color to tell us that these two beams are connected to the column. Um, so by doing that, we can add a filter. Now, uh, Arup have developed the, the, the template that they're already set into our models and all the groups are already set up, but like to give a background on how we got to that place. And, and it's something that like company wide or um, your own preference, you might set it up, but it's something that will happen and, and, and is really, really beneficial. So like going add and going to edit new, add your filter, similar to any filters you'd apply to a project. But in this case, I'm adding a connected and an unconnected and maybe like a manual connected nodes, so ones that I have changed. So I'm kind of tracking the ones that I actually modified just to double check that they're still the same level, that they're, I haven't changed a, a location of where they're connected. I haven't put it out by 100 mil. So it's kind of those kind of issues that I like to track. So when we've got all those and we apply them to our model, we have a connected, unconnected. So we're more of a visual representation of what's going on in the structure. And it's a quick check to say, right, I know all the bottom are unconnected because I don't actually have a support in there. I don't have a foundation or anything modeled as of yet. So then, and all the connected, I can tell that the all the beams and all the columns are connected. So as you dive in a small bit further, um, you can see the nodes and you can click on a node. So you can modify it very, very very quickly by looking at the local or global coordinates. So depending on what location you want to move it. So if by happen that you got a red color of one of the tops, you can actually move the node by just clicking and dragging and it'll highlight the member it wants it to connect to. Or you can um, do, use an align tool. So like this is the align tool. So sometimes when you zoom in, you might have find have a green that all the beams are connected, but the top of the column, they're not connected to the top of the column, which is where the exact position that I'd like them to connect to. So by doing that, all you need to do is just use the align tool, which is one of the things that I find really um, useful. So literally just aligning one to the other. So sometimes then we end up with very complex geometry. So searching like trusses, or you might have very, unusual elevations. So reference planes, and I know many people might have used these already in Revit before. So I'm just kind of using them as an example of using it for the analytical model. So not the structure, not aligning it for the, the frame itself, but using it as from the structural engineer's point of view. So creating reference planes. So you can align them to a degree or a slope and, and a set a member to it. So you can align it to the top boom of a truss or the bottom boom of a truss. And then you can say you want it to set on the reference plane. You want it to tell it to be alignment to the center of the member or you want it to be the top. Um, so say your top boom is an eye section. You want it to be the top flange of the, that, that member. So you can set all that within reference planes and, and they become really handy. So once we have our structure all created, the next thing we want to do is the transfer. So what do we want to check before the transfer is the low cases. So some in Revit, there is default low cases that are brought in. So when you open up that, you can um, create your own ones. You can modify the ones that are there. Um, you might add your own combinations. So there is, a, I suppose, a balancing act in this kind of case. So whether it's your preference or your company's preference to go, we'd like to have all our low cases set into Revit. So you can set them all out there, but they might change throughout the project's life, life cycle. So in certain cases, you might not have seismic, like in Ireland, we don't have a seismic zone, so you might never use that. But then in other cases, you might have a dynamic load. So you might be looking at certain frame that has dynamic action acting on it and from a machine or something, and you would like to add that in. So I tend to do the low cases and the combinations in robot, just because when you get to the combinations terms, there's multiple combinations to do, but then robot, the structural analysis tool also has generates low cases for you based on like say a wind and how the wind operates the whole way around the building. So I prefer to use robot in that case, but there is the option to always use the Revit ones as well. Um, so then once we transfer, so in Revit, there is on the top bar, there is the settings where you can click under the analyze tab, there's already robot built in and there's analysis link. So when you open up that, um, you can send a model to robot um, and then you can also update a model back as well. So anything that changes in robot, you can click update model and that will bring it back into Revit um, and highlight the changes that have happened. Okay, so like again with this, there's send options that you can 
change the, the loadings at the self weight, you might change that the dead weight, or you might ignore all the loadings altogether. Um, and then you can answer or sorry, add in other transfers like any steel connections you created. But at this phase of our project, we haven't actually had gotten to that stage yet. Um, but maybe there might be a certain steel connection, you might be just looking at one thing, and it's easier to model it in Revit, you might just then transfer it afterwards. So there's different options that you can do. Um, just one watch it and I've come across it multiple times by working on multiple projects at the same time, I'd have multiple robots open or maybe multiple Revit's open and different versions of Revit or different versions of robots. So just to watch that only you should really only have one robot and one Revit open. Um, coming from experience of me transferring one robot in that one project into the other project by accident. Um, so then there's also limitation there. So after you transfer a model or update a model, you'll always get kind of like warnings. So like whether it's there's a beam or brace slightly off axis, there might be uh, loadings not transferred, there might be errors with members. So it's just to be wary of them and always just expand them so that you understand where they're coming from and how to apply them. Some are, could be ignored and more than likely some are ignored um, because you're just trying to get something into your Revit model or your robot model and, and understand the main frame rather than looking at little indiscrepancies. So, so just watch the, those error messages and then also modifying an element in robot may lead to changes in Revit. So like uh, when I mean when I say that it's kind of more like if you move the full building 20 meters to the right in robot um, your Revit when you send it back or update it into Revit there's going to be a huge um, error here because everything's off um, and so you should really stick to your workflow methodology at the start so if you're going for the design focused you should really go everything that you're changing physically should be done in Revit and then push to robot again. OK, so just keep it a watch it there. So another one then that I've come across is cladding. So this is not your typical elevation cladding that's done architecturally. This is an um, it's, it's, it's a tool in robot that allows you to put on a panel loading. Um, so it's basically an area spreading a load through an area, but without adding a specific uh, thickness to that element, without adding any parameters to that element, it's literally just load, load dispersion, basically. So they disappear. So if you added them into a robot and you transfer it back to Revit, they disappear. And it's just to remember that they're not actually any element. There's no thickness. There's no specific. There's no detail on them. Um, but when you do send it back to robot, they are remembered. So it's kind of just something kind of little tip and trick that I've come across um, previously. And then what I also have come across, I suppose, and it's something to watch because you might get so engrossed in the physical frame, um, but you forget about the Anishka model and the Anishka model being the one and only thing that you're looking forward to when you're starting off drawing. So like your truss on your left might be absolutely fantastic, but then you look at the right and it's a disaster. So just to be aware that you are look or modeling the Anishka model, not the physical model at this stage in, in, the, in the elements. So workflow. So this is kind of a workflow that myself and Arab have kind of worked through over the last few years and, and my team. So it's basically looking at Revit and Robot, the link between those and, and how we benefit between. So like I'm finding it easy to use, others might find it a bit more difficult or don't have, uh, wouldn't dive into it a bit further. Like you can model different elements in robots. So if we were on about, so this is our preferred workflow. So like you model it in, in Revit, you send it to robot for the analysis. You model the elements if there's any like low cases, boundary conditions, adding your releases, your supports, um, your offsets maybe if there's something along those lines, then you perform your analysis in robot and then you update the elements into, into Revit. Um, so it's just to kind of watch that like this might repeat and repeat, repeat. So like there's some degree of interoperability. So this is an interoperability at its best, but there might be the errors that I have mentioned previously. So we're still getting a good workflow that would have saved, I suppose, you spending another two or three days doing up sketches to send to someone to draw. You have, you have it right there. You have the physical model, but it does involve some more time from the engineer than the modeler. Um, so one example um, I'm going to go through, and it's one, it's best pharmaceuticals in my home county. Um, so basically, um, this is a huge structure um, split into three actually buildings, and we modeled it in Revit um, in for the, the structure, and then we transferred it to Robot, and then we also transferred it back. So as openings started being developed in, in structural slabs or our, our steel work started moving, we were able to send it to robot and update it straight away. And, and the loadings were there and we were able to up, um, 
carry out our analysis to make sure that works or you know it has to move left or this beam has it's clashing with a beam so like there's think different elements that we work through and then taking it a step further and like looking at so with Revit you can send just different items so like just selecting one building um, and transferring that in and doing your analysis and making sure those kind of elements work so that's just one example so as you move on um, I suppose is the future so what what do we think is going to happen? So like, I suppose taking from our structural design analysis, we want to speed that up a bit further and go towards an automation and scripting software. So within our, we're developing and working on and using these tools on many um, of our projects. So like using Rhino, um, using Grasshopper, using Revit all the time, and maybe a plugin from Dynamo. Um, so like, how we're applying these in projects. So I'm just gonna give like a few examples that the teams in Eric have been doing over the past um, nearly three or four years at this stage, but like, so we're developing more um, in the rebar modeling automation. So this is kind of, I suppose, jumping from the structure analysis and, and what Revit can offer and, and what we're looking at from Tekla structures and from Grasshopper. So looking at, the detailing within the two and binding up the scripting so that it actually happens and it's detailed then in Revit. And then we're kind of, oh sorry, and then we're kind of going on to looking at rebar modeling automation. So I'm just gonna play a quick um, video here. So it's basically setting up a tool between Python. So Python is another scripting software and Revit and making it work through the detailing aspects of it. So like adding in, maybe taking away from the full, the rebar quantity or congestion and, and spreading it out, giving it bar ranges um, and doing it very quickly by just using a quick scripting tool. So those are kind of different elements that we're using within um, within Arup at the moment. And they're, and it's, it's kind of the way the world is changing at the moment when we're going through all this kind of automation and getting to a detail, but obviously backing it up with our, our old and old hand calculations so going way back just to verify that everything is, is as it seems. So I suppose that's where I'm going to leave it for today. Um, I'm just from a structural point of view and the BIM interoperability. So like there's obviously benefits and, and there's um, disadvantages of like where links are broken between two elements, but it depends on like the project lifecycle. It depends on the, the project itself and the team capable of, of the, the software. And then it also depends on what stage you're at. So like whether you're at scheme and whether the, the structure engineer might just do a quick scheme and it's already there waiting for the technician or the CAD modeler, or maybe you have more time and you look at the developing of the model and keeping the link alive as the project develops. So thanks very much for listening. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, Shona. Excellent presentation and uh, great to see the efficient workflows that Arab are employing. I think the efficiency is certainly one side of it, but having the quality assurance side whereby, you know, the same uh, geometry that's created in Revit is then going to the structural analysis system, that's, that's the other side of the coin as well, which is obviously very important. So I guess that, that will bring us on to our, our Q&A session. So I guess be, before we start, maybe I would just take an opportunity to thank Suzanne and Shannon and Yelena for organizing a fantastic regional week again. Um, I think everyone will agree that it has been an excellent week. So maybe just to kick things off and then I'll, I'll go to the chat. I might just kick things off with, with the first question. So I'd like to maybe just start there with, with, with James. So, so James, you gave a, a fantastic presentation there. And as I say, it's great to see that offsite construction is finally kind of getting the recognition it needs within, within Ireland. I guess we hear a lot about the housing crisis. Um, and I guess it was great to see in your presentation that a lot of the offsite solutions now are built into categories. So whether that be modular, panelized, whatever the case is. Would you see any of these categories kind of specifically that might be most beneficial in trying to address the, the, the housing crisis? Or is it kind of just, it's not a really a one size solution fits all. It's kind of down to the design for manufacturing again. It depends on kind of the scheme, uh, which solution you, you, you go with. Yeah, so I suppose um, the, every, every, every kind of, um, you know, certain, certain jobs will be more applicable uh, between one uh, manufacturing type than another, like in the category two side of things, what I would say is in the last um, in the last probably five years, there's probably been over a thousand units between all the manufacturers built on the housing side, specifically for social housing. Um, a lot of the the councils like DCC, Cork, Limerick, and, and and all the other ones around Dublin, 
are all starting to embrace all these various uh, uh, various systems through their uh, tender. So, um, and it's slowly, it's gradually building. So, like you know, we've we've delivered two or three stories. Like there's there's a, there's a vast amount under construction as we speak today. We're going to you know social housing our social units up to eight stories using their system. So. Um, it's probably like they all have their benefits and they all have their suitabilities, but they like they're they all they're all well able to adapt to to the various um, design requirements that are that are required. But what you're going to see in the next three to nine months is you're going to see a, a massive, significant amount of delivery projects going through the finalised stage. That you'll you'll see much um, much more kind of um, how to say it? you'll see it much more in the public realm where they're being applied. Excellent, James. Yes, no, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for the offsite sector at the moment. And I think in the era of COVID, like as well as all the quality issues and the program efficiency it offers, like having people offsite is obviously a key thing now. So um, it, it's almost a perfect storm really for the offsite sector at the moment, it would seem. It was, yeah. So like like when 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 COVID did hit, um, luckily enough, the, the various manufacturing facilities were able to bring in kind of strict COVID um requirements and, and working within the rules but kind of I suppose uh, managing the risk of them being able to continue um, um, in, in, in that environment with you know with more kind of controlled processes so a lot of them uh, thankfully and from our perspective luckily that they, they did they did keep us very busy last year through various um, schemes. Brilliant uh, excellent uh, James thanks for that so maybe John and if, if I could just go to you then next um, so you know, excellent presentation. Great to see some of the architectural tools that are out there at the moment. I guess for, for practices that haven't quite jumped onto the BIM bandwagon, I guess, just yet, uh, in particular, maybe small firms, which they don't kind of have that critical mass of larger firms where it's more difficult for them to get the training, et cetera. What would you kind of maybe say to those firms or would you maybe encourage them that, like, how could they possibly get started and what, what, what would be the benefits for them to get started? Great. Thank you, Sean. Um, first off, I, I would definitely encourage them to, to get started somewhere on, on their BIM ladder. Um, I, would all, I think it's important to discern between the size of projects uh, that BIM is used for or you know, what a BIM process really is for a complex project versus a small project. They're obviously going to be completely different. Uh, so I think that's something to keep in mind for, for small firms. Um, but, but even just to initially look at using some sort of BIM software, even just to pull your design drawings and your 3D model, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's stage one where you start. And once you start doing that, you know, people actually then realize, oh, the software can actually give me this information. I can actually now quantify this data by using this software. Um, and your, your BIM journey will kind of grow uh, in that sort of capacity as well. And look, there are lots of training courses and consultancies out there that do specialize in this. Um, but I, I think the main thing is just pick a pilot project um, and commit to it and, and doing it in a, you know, whether it's a Revit workflow or some type of uh, BIM software workflow, commit to doing it, uh, take baby steps, don't bite off more you can chew initially, uh, just aim to pull your drawings and your 3D model and then the rest will, will, will grow from that uh, eventually. Excellent. No, I, I think absolutely. I, I guess most people will agree, you know, BIM is kind of here to stay. And I guess, yeah, an entry level might be taking that project that, that, that you're delivering in your traditional workflow, but maybe mirroring that, you know, you buy uh, Autodesk Revit or whatever you get, a uh, BIM altering software, and, and you could mirror the project. So that's great. Um, maybe, Sean, if, if I could just put one to you and, and I'll have a quick look through the chat then to see if, if we've missed any questions. Just uh, interesting to see now that the likes of Python are even being used within Arup. Like, so, you know, again, it's that kind of industry four type feel. Now we have kind of computer programmers starting to become almost part of our, our design teams now, which is very interesting and, and a new development. So w within Arup, are there people now that would kind of specifically deal with Python scripting and try to look at kind of novel ways in which they can use that? Or is it, it, is it a case that existing engineers are kind of upskilling and, and, and they're learning those Python programming skills? Yeah, I suppose if we take it back a step, we have like our structural team are developing skills and say Dynamo and Grasshopper, like the scripting from that point of view. And then we also have a digital team then who have who are very proficient in Python and, and we would reach out to those because Arab is such a global company with so many offices worldwide, like yeah. we reach out to those who are actually very, very like deal with Python every day um, and you send them 
or you might have set up a call and have a discussion on what you're trying to achieve and and they'd have it done within a few hours and then like I suppose they'd pass it back on or we usually also some engineers within the team then would have basic levels of Python Mm -hmm. so like if you're very interested in the whole scripting aspect of structural design and how you get from one I suppose a piece of paper and you're able to like do the the geometric modeling or the parametric modeling as you showed previously in dynamo um like if when you get to that aspect it's, it's just vital i suppose in part of your structural career but like on other times um you can use it in every day and you can see the benefits and the efficiencies from it excellent okay no very interesting times for the aec sector i guess i'd like to open it to the floor is there anyone there at the moment that there, there was kind of quite a bit of back and forth going on in the chat but it looks like most people have kind of answered their questions through the chat facility is there anyone that would like to ask any of our panels of speakers a question if so if you'd like to raise your hands i'd, I'd very much invite you to the floor uh yeah, is, is it okay if I ask a, a question? Yeah, there? absolutely, not, Daniel. Sorry, right yeah, there. I, I wasn't able to find the, the hand button. And my one is <laughs> for, uh, for Jonathan, just uh, with regards to the format. Uh, so I, I can see that the, the interface looks very, very similar to, to Rhino. And what we generally use in, in our when we're working with Rhino is Grasshopper to be able to do parametric optimization. And I was just looking to see, is there any way to link um, Dynamo to that for all the, the parametric changes? Because it seemed very, very powerful that you're able to do such such a quick model and to be able to, to do all your, your lighting analysis and such. Very good question, Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, yes, th- there's a complete Dynamo toolbar in that, actually. I, I, I did Beautiful. cover it in that, but, the, but there's, oh, uh, th- there's a complete Dynamo toolbar um, within uh, Format, and it actually comes pre-installed with scripts, and you can make all of your own scripts as well. So that's to, it is similar, to, from what I understand, to, to Grasshopper and Rhino. Uh, type workflows for for uh, you know manipulating your geometry uh, or even just creating uh, different types of geometry w- within your uh, format model as well. So uh, yes, is the answer. That's that's great to hear. And and then Sean, I was going to direct a, a question to you about the, the your your level eight and BIM course with the, one of the, the the scripting modules. So I see that that you look um, a lot at um, Dynamo, which is an extremely powerful scripting um, program. It's just especially powerful for mechanical and electrical engineers, whereas over on the, the structural engineering side, we've seen that we tend to, to work more closely with, um, with Grasshopper and, and Rhino. Uh, we we're wondering, do you um, um, expose any of your students to, to alternative scripting programs, or does your course just generally look at, at Dynamo? So th- thanks for the question, Daniel. I guess in the first instance, it's kind of a bit part of the virtual design and construction module. Now, in time, I can see it becoming a module all of its own because that's just kind of how important it's going to become in the industry. This kind of the, the, the ability to create dynamic, parametrically controlled scripts that can automate that, that geometry creation. Um, so the short answer is we do just focus on Dynamo. I guess we are aware, let's say, that Grasshopper is the more established uh, scripting tool that is available out there. And I, I guess there is pos- potentially or arguably a little bit more functionality in that, especially maybe on the structural design and architectural side of things. But um, we, we, we just focus on the Dynamo. And as, as I say, it's just part of it. But I guess, again, everyone kind of focuses on the geometry side of, of Dom- Dynamo. And I guess you, you, you seem very knowledgeable there yourself. So you, you're, you're probably aware already, like, like the actual ability to mine data with Dynamo is perhaps amongst its its, its greatest strength. Like as yeah. as as we all know, when it comes to creating schedules in a BIM module or a BIM model, some parameters simply aren't going to schedule for you. And your options are you can create shared parameters, of course, but that can be cumbersome or mightn't be a road that you want to go down. But again, if if you have a good script, you can still extract that information. And I guess once you create it once, it's there forevermore and it can be reused and, and, and reused again. So in short, we, we sort of focus on Dynamo for now, but I guess in time I could see this almost becoming a special purpose award all of itself, where we would offer kind of a scripting type, uh, you know, semester and someone could get five or 10 credits of a particular award in it. So at the moment, just just Dynamo. That's, that's great. And, and, and I have to say, it's great that you are having students exposed to it because I know I didn't have the opportunity during, during my studies and yeah, same, Daniel. <laughs> and, and, and I use it on, I wouldn't say on a, on a daily basis, but I definitely be using it once a week or so. And it's just, just the, the pure power of it and just knowing how to be able to format your data is it's, it's invaluable. Actually. And, and it's, it's like, it's, 
it's like anything um you you simply just have to keep using it and using it and using it like i guess you know it is only around kind of what four, four or five years really kind of in mainstream um so like when you think about the export in this field maybe in ireland or, or wherever like that person is potentially only using that technology for, for what four years or so you know so you know if you've got the attitude for it and if it's something you're into you, you can absolutely get up to speed so um, if, if there isn't any other questions from the floor at, at the moment, I will pass over to Alan Hoare. So is there any other questions there? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you for, for all the fantastic presentations. Uh, I won't dwell too long. I see people are beginning to drop off. Sean, thank you. You did a great job on chairing. I didn't get to the meeting till one o'clock today, so I missed James's talk. And, uh, but it's a particular area I'm, I'm interested in. So thank you, James and Jonathan and Shauna. Obviously, they were very technical presentations, very important, I suppose, tips and tricks for particularly for the design community. I mean, I just think this week has been fantastic. We had a great turnout this week. And actually, I learned loads in particular, even in the day I learned how, you know, Rhino could be used for quantity takeoff as a quantity surveyor. So we've got a couple of lectures now looking at that. So I just thought it was a fantastic week. So I'm going to hand over now to Eleni and Shannon or Eleni, who really put in Trojan work this week. But before I do, just to remind you all that, you know, I think we're going to try and do this a little bit more often, if we can. Uh, and, and, and also, uh, you know, perhaps we could do something uh, later after the summer, another regional series. We also have our Tech Trend series that is going on. We're looking at, you know, IoT and sensor technology on the 29th. We've, we've presenters from Denmark, uh, from uh, the Netherlands and from Ireland. And we also have our sustainable, you know, circular economy series, uh, particularly what local authorities are doing around the country. That's happening on the 6th of May. And of course, we have the gathering in September. So lots happening. And I really do appreciate you all taking the time uh, to present uh, this week. It, it was fantastic. So well done, Elenia, to you and the team. Do you want to say a few words? Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for attending this fantastic week. And thank you for hosting and to all the speakers and the sponsors, obviously, Dietech and uh, Arup. Um, yeah, no, like really, like, you know, just a few words uh, to, to say thank you. And uh, that, uh, like, you know, CETA Skillnet is uh, uh, providing with 30% funding on any training costs. So, you know, pl please do get in touch, you know, and uh, please do attend events uh, such as like this one anyway, you know, and uh, stay connected to, to everyone. Okay. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, much, guys. Fantastic job. Enjoy, enjoy the weekend, everyone, and take care.